Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. These three countries have banned Russians from entering on a Schengen visa. Moreover, Lithuania proposed to extend such a ban to the whole EU. Thank God it did not happen. Latvia has stopped issuing new temporary residence permits and in order to obtain a permanent residence permit, it will be necessary to prove knowledge of the Latvian language, otherwise it will be revoked. All these restrictions apply only to citizens of Belarus and Russia. If you have a passport of these countries, you get a restriction or even a revocation of the document if you are not ready to learn the language at the required level. This is the true discrimination on the basis of passport. Thus, it is possible to inadvertently believe in the words of Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev about the insane bolts and chronic Russophobe diarrhea. In this video, we will try to understand the motives of the Baltic states. We will try to answer the question of why their speeches towards Russians sound very radical even by the standards of, as Medvedev said, the big pack of barking dogs from the kennels of the West. As far back as the days of yore, the Baltics were constantly being invaded by colonizers. But we will start our research with the events closer to our times, which resonate with stunning echoes to the present day and are the reason for the unfriendly attitude of the Baltics towards the Russians. We shall start our studies from 1918, when independent republics of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia were established. This time is called the Interwar Twenties. As you remember, the Nazis would soon establish a totalitarian dictatorship in Germany and World War II would break out. The Baltics, of course, will be affected, at least for geographical reasons. If you're as bad at geography as I am, this is what it looks like on the map. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia and Poland proper being surrounded by Nazis on one side and communists on the other, purely by geography are doomed to be dragged into a showdown between one of their neighbours, either to the red or to the black. Of course, they could and did say that they wanted to be sovereign and neutral, but what could they do against the brute physical force of the red or the black? Thus, in 1939, the Soviet Union received the right to introduce troops into these countries, and in 1940, the Baltics became part of the USSR. And this is where the difference in perception and interpretation begins. But here is the problem. If one assimilates only the Soviet Russian version of these events, it does not provide the reasons for Russophobia. Russophobia appeared as if on its own, as if at the level of genetics or collective unconsciousness. The Russian version goes something like this. If you look at the map, Poland and the Baltics are potential bases for the Nazi threat, and this is not some ephemeral threat, but a very real one. Hitler had already unleashed the war on September the 1st of 1939, and as we all know, he will not stop further on. As soon as the war started, the class conflict in the Baltics escalated, and supporters of cooperation with Germany emerged. The signing of the treaties, the introduction of the Soviet forces and then joining the Soviet Union was not unilateral and was done by mutual agreement. The step was necessary, legitimate, peaceful and natural. Conversion to communism was demanded by the locals. The Baltic was not losing its independence and all actions were aimed at defending against the Third Reich. Any other interpretations are perceived as a rewriting of true history. Such rhetoric is considered the only true rhetoric in these times in Russia. But we will bring up the transcripts of the conversations of those in power, just as we have done in previous videos about the not an inch to the east and the story of NATO's first extension. Then you will be able to tell which point of view you yourself hold.
Generally, the first statements that the Soviet Union would not allow the Baltic territories to be friends with anyone else can be found on the 28th of March, 1939. You can pause the video and read this piece, but the point is as follows. We are all for your independence. We are even more for your independence than you are. So if you sign any agreement with another country that we don't like, even if you do it voluntarily, then expect consequences. If necessary, we will prove to you that we will keep your independence. We will not remain an indifferent spectator. Very soon, on September the 1st, Hitler will invade Poland and World War II will begin. As soon as this whole movement starts, the Baltics immediately declare neutrality, saying, do it without us. But this does not save them much. On the 24th of September, not even a month into the war, the Estonian foreign minister, a man with the surname Selta, arrives in Moscow to pay attention here to discuss economic issues, increased trade between the countries. But Vyacheslav Molotov, the key Soviet politician and diplomat at the time, had other plans. He wanted to place military bases on the territory of Estonia and other republics. A discussion ensues between them which is worth listening to carefully. Effective guarantees must be given to the Soviet Union to strengthen its security. The Politburo and the Soviet government decided to demand such guarantees from the Estonian government and to that end proposed the conclusion of a military alliance or a mutual assistance treaty that would also guarantee the Soviet Union the right to have naval and air force bases or strongholds on Estonian territory. As for the issues raised by you, the Mutual Aid and Bases Pact, I do not have the authority to discuss it. I can only say that these proposals go against the policy of equal relations, neutrality with all states, which Estonia, especially in recent years, has pursued so impeccably. This policy is so entrenched in our country that Estonia does not want, I am sure, to abandon this policy and does not want to enter into a military alliance, even if it's called an aid pact with a great power, in this case, the Soviet Union. Who doesn't want to? You don't want to. The ruling group doesn't want to. But broad circles in Estonia and the people do. We know that. Fear not, the aid agreement with the Soviet Union poses no threat. We do not intend to affect your sovereignty or your statehood. We do not intend to impose communism on Estonia. We do not want to touch Estonia's economic system. Estonia will retain its independence, its government, parliament, foreign and domestic policy, army and economic order. We will not touch all of this. If you are not willing to make a mutual assistance pact with us, then we will have to use other ways to guarantee our security. Maybe more steep, maybe more complicated. Please do not force us to use force against Estonia. That is, Selta came to Moscow to discuss trade, and then he is asked to introduce troops into his country under the auspices of the Pact of Mutual Assurance. Moreover, the Estonian representative tried to ask for time to discuss it with his team, but Molotov made it clear that delay was impossible. Once again, this is an urgent matter. The situation requires an urgent solution. We cannot wait long. I advise you to go along with the wishes of the Soviet Union in order to avoid the worst. Do not force the Soviet Union to use force in order to achieve its aims. Do not pin your hopes on England and Germany. England was in no position to do anything on the Baltic Sea and Germany was bound by the war in the West. All hope of outside help would now be illusions. So you can be sure that the Soviet Union will ensure its security one way or another. If you had not agreed to our proposals, the Soviet Union would have implemented its security measures in another way, at its own will and without Estonia's consent. On such a friendly note, the equal conversation between the two partners ended. By the way, the trade agreement was not signed. They decided to postpone it until after the signing of the Mutual Assistance Pact. So it was either all or nothing. According to Molotov, the matter was urgent, therefore the pact was signed very quickly. 
On the 24th of September, Estonia came to Moscow to discuss trade. And on the 28th, just four days later, the pact was signed, which allowed Soviet troops to be stationed in Estonia. After the pact was signed, Stalin congratulated CELTA in a friendly manner. The agreement has been reached. I can tell you that the Estonian government acted wisely and for the benefit of the Estonian people in concluding the agreement with the Soviet Union. You could have ended up like Poland. Poland was a great power. Where is Poland now? The rest of the Baltic states have signed similar agreements. There is some debate about the justification for introducing Soviet troops into the Baltics. Some say it was necessary for protection against Hitler, others say it did not work. But we are discussing the question of voluntary placement of Soviet bases on foreign territory. Similar to one of our previous videos, where the presidents of Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary worked Clinton over several years to get them into NATO. Here, the conversations have a completely different atmosphere. Moreover, in a book of a military historian, Mikhail Milchukov, it is described how in 1940 a teacher lecturing to fifth-year students told that Estonia was under military pressure, there was an ultimatum, and if Estonia did not agree, occupation awaited it. Then the introduction of Soviet troops was compared like letting a buddy into your flat who first takes over one room, then takes over the whole flat and drives the owner out of it himself. After this sacrilege, the teacher was expelled from the Communist Party and his case was taken up by the NKVD, the Ministry of Internal Affairs of back then. Allusions to modern Russia are impressive. And the teacher was right. After all, a few months after the troop deployment, the Baltics would become part of the USSR, despite Molotov's statements. Fear not. The aid agreement with the Soviet Union poses no threat. We do not intend to affect your sovereignty or your statehood. We do not intend to impose communism on Estonia. Mikhail Milchukov sums up the events very concisely. The USSR's actions in relation to the Baltics, unlike measures to annex other Eastern European territories considered by the Soviets to be their sphere of interest, provide an example of a complex multi-track combination. German recognition of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania as a zone of Soviet interests and the war in Europe allowed the USSR to impose mutual assistance treaties on these countries, giving Moscow legal leverage in the region recognized by Britain and France as a lesser evil than the German occupation. Having taken the first step towards penetrating the Baltics, the Soviet leadership ostentatiously did not interfere in the internal affairs of these countries, patiently awaiting its time. The defeat of France and the expulsion of the British army from the continent paved the way for the annexation of the Baltics. The diplomatic conflict created by the Soviets and the threat of a military invasion presented the Baltic governments with a choice. Fight or surrender. Considering the futility of military resistance and the disinterest of the great powers of Europe in the affairs of the Baltics, it was decided to capitulate and the Soviet leadership, thus breaking all its agreements with Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, brought in troops and began the deliberate Sovietization of the region. In this way, using the Anglo-French-German contradictions, the USSR managed to regain control of the strategically important region, strengthen its position on the Baltic Sea, and create a bridgehead against East Prussia. Some would say that the Soviets did not impose anything on anyone at all. There was just a change of government. There was just an election. Just so-called polite people were stationed in the country. Just the communist parties won and they just decided to join the union. I honestly find it very hard to believe that just one year after the introduction of troops, a government changes its ideology by 180 degrees and joins another country just like that. Here, even without knowing anything else, the voluntariness looks highly improbable. 
The cherry on top is that communism was forbidden by law in Estonia until 1940. And here, not only has the ban been lifted, but they've also turned themselves into communists. Such shifts are certainly possible, but not as abruptly. It all happens gradually, over years, if not decades. In general, after the Red Army entered the Baltics, the situation began to escalate. The Soviets accused the Lithuanian government of being involved in the kidnapping of Red Army soldiers. Moreover, when Lithuania wanted to investigate the case and interrogate the so-called victims who, incidentally, returned alive, Moscow refused a detailed joint investigation. Then the Soviets accused Lithuania of seeking to surrender to Germany and activate the Fifth Column, quite a familiar rhetoric nowadays. Elections then took place in which the communists won in all three countries and decided to become part of the Soviet Union. A year later, in 1941, just before the start of the Great Patriotic War in USSR, the Soviet authorities launched a special operation to cleanse the population of anti-Soviet, criminal and socially dangerous elements. Simply put, people were deported, sent to settlements and labor camps in the distant places. People were visited in their homes. The charges were read out, and then they were taken away. In one month, more than 40,000 local people were sent into exile. There is an opinion that most of them were criminals, but they were not. Even the estimate of those sent to labor camps is just over 10%. But I use the estimate of the Memorial Human Rights Center. If you listen to the Russian side, the number of deportees would also be four times lower and the number of criminals up to 90%. The statistics would break down. And I would like to end this part about voluntary accession to the Soviets in my favorite way, with a quote from Mr. Molotov, by which it is clear that the acquisition of the Baltics had been discussed and agreed in advance, with Hitler. The question of the Baltics, Western Ukraine, Western Belarusia, and Bessarabia was resolved with Ribbentrop in 1939. The Germans were reluctant for us to annex Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Bessarabia. When I was in Berlin a year later, in November 1940, Hitler asked me, All right, you are uniting the Ukrainians, the Belarusians together. All right, the Moldovans. This can still be explained. But how do you explain the whole world about the Baltics? I told him, we will explain. As I said, I condemn any discriminatory passport acts, but one cannot react to them without context. Spain, for some reason, did not make any harsh statements or initiatives to break off relations with Russia because it did not go through what the Baltics went through. After the Baltic states were forced into a mutual assistance pact, had troops brought in, changed governments and joined the Union, all the while they had the intention of breaking away, not just from the USSR, but even from the orbit of its influence. How do we know that? Well, it's just that these three countries were the first to bring up the discussion about their sovereignty in 1988. Moreover, they consider membership in the Union as an occupation. They enshrined this explicitly in three declarations. Estonia. The politics of Stalinism and the period of stagnation ignored the principle of sovereignty and the flourishing of the Estonian nation. This resulted in an unfavorable situation. Further development can only be seen in the conditions of sovereignty. Lithuania. The sovereign state of Lithuania was forcibly and illegally annexed to the Soviet Union. Even today, the Soviet government ignores the Republic's aspirations for even economic self-sufficiency. Further development can only be seen in the condition of sovereignty. Latvia. 
The ultimatum note from the Stalinist government of the USSR at the time, handed to the government of the Republic of Latvia on the 16th of June 1940, demanding a change of government, and the 17th of June 1940 armed aggression of the USSR, must be regarded as international crime, which resulted in the occupation of Latvia. We recognize the return of the official name of the state of Latvia, the Latvian Republic, abbreviated to Latvia, which was lost in 1940. Moreover, all these declarations began with the recollection that we had been independent for 20 years before we joined the USSR, and now it's not so good. We can assume that, in fact, all these three countries have dreamed all their lives of being part of the USSR, and from the late 80s to the present day they have been bewitched by European wizards who weave intrigues against the Holy Russia. Let's just imagine that. But since we can't unenchant them, can we imagine how they feel about the Russian act of special operation on February the 24th? Given this, although I do not approve of their discriminatory behavior towards Russians and Belarusians, I am sympathetic because of the historical context. They have their reasons for acting this way, and think about this. After all, if Russia believes that there are only enemies in the West, then Russia has to learn to listen to the enemy. What is their motive? You know who to share this video with. We say a big thank you to the big guys from the Patreon. Cheers for supporting us all this time. And I'm The Researcher.